Welcome, and thanks for coming. My name is Lucas, and in this talk, we will learn to bridge. Um, we'll we learn to understand what it takes to bridge the gap between design and development. We will look for a seamless integration. When you hand over designs, a room for a misunderstanding and a room for a conflict arises. This misunderstanding is being referred to as the gap. We will learn different mechanisms, and I will provide you concrete takeaways. I would ask you to try out if you're interested and see if it really makes a difference. Come on, there we go. I work as a UX engineer in the platforms team of an international media company, and I just got asked the question, what do I do? Do I code? Do I develop? Or do I design? And I would say 30% of my time I code, 20% of my time I develop, I design, and the other 50% I communicate. And what a UX engineer is, I will tell you later. But I got hooked by web development since the age of 10. I worked for a few years as a freelancer. I worked in small and medium-sized teams. I studied media computer science, and I was always fascinated by this bridge between design and development because both are creative people, but oftentimes there is a misunderstanding. And that's what I will talk to you today about. I started three years ago as a software engineer. Then I moved on to front-end development. And since one year, I now work in the user experience team um, for a global website. And uh, I want to show you my journey and what happened along the way. And on this journey, I found out that there are always areas for improvement, especially on how people collaborate on how problems are solved, and on which problems get solved. Good. When talking about this gap, we first need to understand it in order to solve it. Let me illustrate this for you based on one uh, scenario. Imagine you're in a large, complex software scenario, and user research has shown that your navigation does not work of your website. So now you've got the task for a developer and a designer to come out with a better and new way of navigation. Designers will look where to go. They will look at different websites and think about what's the best way of doing it. The developers will look at how to do it. And this is also the biggest difference, if I would have to simplify it, and also contains the intrinsic room for conflict. Developers and designers, doesn't work. There we go. Developers, there we go. Developers and designers Basically, there's a clash between two different ways of solving problems. There are two ways of thinking, two ways of finding solutions, and the goals are often different. As I said, where against how. And the good news is that both are born problem solvers. So it's not too late. And what does it take? This gap or miscommunication is often due to lack of understanding of each other's needs. And having a translator role in between can make all the difference. But now the question for you, since this gap is sometimes abstract and sometimes not, who of you has experienced the gap between design and development? Good, so that's roughly more than half. And who of you is a developer? Okay, who is a designer? Who is neither nor? Good, I'm like you. So. Next, I want to show you two ways of how good and how bad collaboration can be. Have a look at this. I think I'll do it like that. So what does a 100-year-old lady crossing the street have in common with how teams often work? For me, it resembles the dysfunctions of a team. In this scenario, you see no alignment. You see different goals, lacking coordination, and no teamwork. What it also illustrates is that one person can make the difference to get from chaos to having a clear focus and a good collaboration. Good collaboration should look much more like this. It's about having a close collaboration with high trust and a willingness to experiment. It's not about going far alone. It's about going far together, about knowing each other's strengths and using them in the best way. And there are different ways to approach this gap. And what I can tell you, the struggle is real. Interdisciplinary collaboration is something which has been around for a long time. I did some research and I found papers from the 1990s 
uh, from the area of medicine, where they discuss how do different areas work together. And from that, I took some learnings with me, and there are different ways to approach it. In a very simplified way, I would describe it as top-down versus bottom-up. And top-down is organizational, which takes longer, and has, you need to convey more, and bottom-up is up to you, and you can take immediate action. But there's a third axis. It's the area between us. It's interpersonal, the area of psychology and communication. Many factors play a role in how work, teams work together. In companies where waterfall dominates, the issue of the gap is much more significant. And also the team size plays a big role. If you think about it, in startups, or if you're just a one-man show, there's no gap. In the larger the team gets, the larger the need for communication becomes. In large companies, you've got more specialists, and the more specialists you have, the more important it becomes to communicate. And we had great talks about this previously. But there's no universal recipe. So what I want to do now is to show you a few underlying principles which help, which help me in my daily work and ways of closing this gap. When you look, search or Google for this, exactly this title, there are many answers. And the classic ones are always sit close to each other. I've tried it out. It does make a difference. It's important. So use the face time you have. The more unplanned communication you have, the better it is for collaboration. <laughs> also, use the right tools. Every year, two or three new frameworks or uh, tools come up. Um, Zeppelin works really well for us, or Abstract and Adobe XD. So experiment with it, but don't, give, don't think the holy grail is a tool. It's somewhere else. And the last, but for me also the trickiest one, because I don't agree with it, is having a good design development handover. Because if you have a handover, it's exactly where the problem starts. Because you acknowledge that you have a gap. What I want to focus on now are these underlying principles for good communication. These help me in my daily work, and they should help you reflect on why there are boundaries. If there's a gap, there's a boundary, there's a miscommunication. And the, right, the five key ingredients for myself are, guess, whoops. It starts off with trust. Trust is the foundation of collaboration. Without trust, you don't collaborate normally. And trust is built by four, area, by four pillars, by competence, by relatability, by integrity, and by communication. What I recommend is to invest in shared time. Shared time is so critical. It comes with small things. For example, having a shared lunch between design and development, about having shared dailies, or share your planning sessions. What also works great is having mixed teams in hackathons and uh, really trying out new ways of working together. The second big pillar is having open and transparent communication. And oftentimes I saw when you have a handover, you see it as a communication in one direction. You hand it to one person. But I think that's also where the second issue lies. Because if you have good and open communication, it always goes in both directions. So see it as a constant and steady flow of regular communication, allowing for feedback. Also without, not just within your team, but also from other people. And there are great books and literature about it. What helped me a lot were books on nonverbal and nonviolent communication. So basically, looking at what happens outside of the words you speak. And I will also share the slides and a bunch of literature afterwards, so if you're interested, dig deeper. What it really boils down to for me is bring developers in regularly. When designers are getting started and run ide design ideas by them so that you can identify any issues with code early. But it also goes the other way around. Don't just bring uh, developers in, but also bring designers in. For us as des uh, developers, it means show your half-finished work in progress states, bring them to a designer and say, hey, what do you think? Because like, that's what a regular communication means. It's not just about these one-time meetings. So like, it's a bi-directional constant flow of communication. 
what, what I tried out since a year roughly now, and it works great for me, are inside sessions. Inside sessions are sometimes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly sessions, or I do them ad hoc when I need it, and I use them to communicate a reason why, and also to inform about changes and to share knowledge. It's a loose form of basically communication where you invite people, but they don't have to come. So it's about sharing and creating a shared vision, because shared vision means that you have an alignment of a team. And that's what you want if you, because basically we shouldn't talk about having two teams. It's about one product team consisting of developers and designers in an ideal world. And in these inside sessions, I try to take people along with me. It's like always having this metaphor, make sure that nobody falls behind on the vision. My fourth key ingredient is to the willingness to experiment and experiment together. So I personally run now Friday experiments where I use them to tackle big projects and to manage risk and fear. It helps to bring people together and if you want to have an initiative to convey ideas in a big company, for example, then it's critical to have people following your vision. And the great thing about these experiments is oftentimes you find out about uh, quick wins. So things which are much easier than you would have thought or than you would have estimated, um, let's say, on the, in the estimation meeting. So experimenting helps me to create a shared vision, to build trust, and it also allows you to find quick wins. And the fifth, but it's a large chunk, and maybe also the hardest for us as individuals to change, is organizational change. It's a whole topic for itself, and I will try to scratch it a bit, but I have great resources for you to follow up. And one, what helps me a lot is to say, don't separate the concept of testing from people involved in the product. So really try to involve your whole team in your testing. That creates a vision, identification with your product. And that will also bottom up, like trickle up to the whole organization. And you can also think of processes like design sprints. The thing is, for every organization, there's a different pattern which works, I believe. And design sprints, the beauty about those is you try to have interdisciplinary teams. You try to bring people together from different backgrounds. And if people are fascinated about something, then they will drive the topic and you will not have a gap. If you're more interested in this, I can highly recommend you to search for UXDX model. It's a model from a conference based in Dublin, and they tackle this whole topic of developer, designer, and product interaction. But now wait. What if you say, all this sounds great, but it's just not working? And I've tried it again and again and again. Then I ask you to look deeper. Because I've had this conversation with friends and with people at conferences, and that was also the motivation why I thought I have something to share. And what I found out what often is the reason why boundaries don't dissolve is because of lacking trust. Lacking trust usually has something to do with fear. So I ask you to understand what is my fear in a project, what is, are other people's fears. Learn to understand what deteriorates trust. And also the second point is, how do you earn trust? So it's about giving and taking there. The second question I would ask you, if you still did not solve it, is do you have a lack of purpose in your team? And a lack of purpose has, leads to a lack of motivation. Oftentimes also, having different goals of teams forces a gap. And you can only highlight that, and the organization has to align the team's goals again. But that is also reasons why if developers and designers, for example, think about a how and a why, then that is already a different goal. And then when you bring the people together, you can solve it much easier. I will show you how in one of the takeaways. The next three for me are team development. I'm still, I would say, juniorish, 
And I read a bit about team development, and there are three key phases. One is the phase of belonging, the second of accountability, and the third of openness in the model I, I will share, and the fourth is termination, so when it ends. And it says that every team goes through these four phases. And especially accountability and openness is something, what I said with trust and open communication, you need to go through these steps of a team. So also I think team building, team um, yeah, building events help a lot there. And the shared vision, which you can do with uh, hackathons, with um, Friday experiments or inside sessions helps a lot. And what I'm happy or like, glad about is to work in teams where there's the openness for improvement, the openness for reflection. And I think everybody who comes to a conference uh, is usually open for improvement and for finding new ideas. So coming to events like this together with your colleagues is a huge a game changer often. I'm pretty fast. That's good. Still doing good? Good. I will take it slower. My, first, my six takeaways for you, which I thought it's nice to hear some underlying principles, but I wanted to share with you our concrete, actionable takeaways and tools to try out. So let me know how they work for you. I'd be interested in seeing if you, something else works for you or if one of them is like the holy grail. And uh, I'll take a sip. The first is to create a mutual understanding. And this is about knowing each other's strengths. Increase the knowledge amongst each other, who's, who likes to work which way, which fears there are, and be encouraging. Share the basic concepts of other teams. It ha can help to have a coding session for designers and a design session about UX principles for developers. Share your, ideas, I, share your ideas and visions. See it as a two-way communication. Ask designers, as a designer, ask a developer for input. And as a developer, ask a designer for input. See it that you, as a team, you're more than just one. And this creates alignment and a mutual understanding. Communicate the reason why. This is a big one, and it gives the what a more purpose, and it provides true motivation. Because the reasons are often not obvious for everybody. And it leads back to the talk from Simon Sinek. So it's about what, how, and why. So communicate the reason why. Focus on the problem, not the solution. This allows you to use everybody's creativity for finding the best solution and it avoids thinking in silos. So when you communicate as a designer that you need something to be done, or as a manager, or as a product manager, don't start with what you want. Start with why you want it, and make sure that everybody understands the same problem. Because if you've got everybody understanding the problem you're trying to solve, if it's a user's problem, a business problem, then you have everybody's creativity, and oftentimes, Designers have a good idea of how to take a shortcut for development, to think outside of the framework, and developers as well for designers. So this is really a good way for us. Allow people to change within the organization. It increases motivation and loyalty. If you're in management, then give your employees the chance to work interdisciplinary and to change roles. If you're a developer and you've always been interested in design and are wondering like, or curious, why do some people design how they design? Ask for a rotation, ask for a chance to become a UX designer. And this is exactly how it worked for me. And I wanna give you short insights how I became a UX engineer, starting from a software engineer. And I saw this illustration here. At first, there's not much there. You see a lot of color and many shades in between. And what it shows is a spectrum of development, of product development. 
On the right, you see a very short glimpse of development. So there's no APIs, no database, no hosting. But the yellow is front-end development for me. And when it comes from yellow to green, this is where design and development interact. But what it also showed me is that there's so much more happening before you even find out what to do as a developer and how many roles there are involved. So it really blew my, my mind because it communicates how many shades there are and how many roles and how many possible gaps there can be. For me, for crucial for building the best product is transferring knowledge, filling those gaps, and translating requirements from my perspective of a UX engineer. And in the larger the teams, the more information loss you have. And this is what a UX engineer does. He's not a unicorn. The graphic skills are missing for that. But he has mixed skills of front-end development and of user experience. And it's an interdisciplinary role, understanding both sides and translating requirements. He takes ideas from concept to implementation. So you try to make sure that you don't, or I don't try to specify Jira tickets. I try to fill those gaps if it's in CSS in a logical pattern for coding, or if it's in just filling or creating those missing designs. And this is my last takeaway for you. Be the difference you want to see. Collaboration is, not about, peop is about people. <laughs> Collaboration is about people. Don't wait for the organization to change. Be the change. Interdisciplinary collaboration is about the achievement of goals. Goals that cannot be reached on your own. Thank you for listening.